strategic, connectedness, relator, responsibility, and restorative. My name is Ophelia Byers. I am the Chief Nursing Officer of Overlook Medical Center and the Associate Chief Nurse Executive of Atlantic Health System. I am also the founder and practitioner of Citroom, a coaching and consulting firm. My biggest aha for my strength is restorative. It was so interesting to learn how much the restorative strength includes exchanging energy, which is very important to me. I'm Darren Barasami. I'm Brandon Miller. And this is The Strengths Whisperer. The show empowering leaders to create, build, and sustain great places to work. On this episode, we have Ophelia Byers. Well, as you know, Ophelia, we are going to be diving into strengths. Brandon loves to be the diving board for leading uh, with some of those jump off questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Brandon. Well, I'm looking at a top five of strategic connectedness, relator, responsibility, restorative. And I'm curious, as we ask each of our guests, which one or two most resonated with you and why? I'd have to say strategic and connectedness, my one and two, really resonated with me. For sure, strategic, the idea that there's more than one way to address an issue, being able to identify that issue pretty quickly, get to the root cause, and then think of the multiple ways that we can go about it. I find that really exciting and important in leadership. Connectedness, I have a very strong passion for diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And so connectedness resonated with me because that importance of finding commonalities between people and building bridges just makes so much sense in the DEI and J space. Awesome. I want to start with strategic. This is one of the 34 Clifton strengths that can sometimes be misunderstood because when people see it show up on their list, they often associate it with strategy. So strategy as defined in the dictionary, high level planning, ability to put in order plans that have you know, clear outcomes, measurable goals. And certainly someone with high strategic can do that. A key component of this strength as defined in StrengthsFinder is the intuition or creativity to choose different pathways, see alternative ways to proceed, and to do so with without much depth of thought. Certainly we each can pull away, take our thinking time, but one might find themselves able to think quickly on their feet, to have a word and answer in the moment of time, and find that that, as they trust their instincts and trust their intuition, that moves fast for them. And it, and it often will mark careers. It will mark personal experiences. And so I'm curious, as I, I, I lay that out a bit more for you, what parts of that do you resonate with? It's deeply resonant for me, Brandon, and it's my belief that leadership is an art and science. And so when you talk about someone immediately going to strategy, I think about the scientific side and sure that's there, but then you mentioned creativity and absolutely you need both of those things. And so Often you'll hear this kind of dichotomy of leader versus manager. And I'm a firm believer that someone who leads well, manages well, someone who manages well, leads well, that it's really not an either or, but it's a combination of things. And the managing is certainly that day-to-day, -day, the operations piece, being metrics focused. And leaders need to do that. But also we need to be culture cultivators. We need to be innovators. To your point, we need to see opportunities always as this blank canvas for us to create with. And so knowing that that shows up for me as a strength is exciting because it's indeed the way that I lead and manage. Excellent. I had a guest recently who said she has a picture that hangs on her wall that says, underestimate me. That'll be fun. And, and I just wonder <laughs> <laughs> if in the course of your career, when you have felt that people may have not giving you the opportunity, the weight of influence, the space that you really could occupy or, or essentially told you, Ophelia, it can't be done or you can't do it. What happens inside of you when something like that comes across? 
So let's envision, if we will, the emoji that has the little crook of one side of its mouth curled up in a smile. And it feels a lot like that sign that you mentioned where you just kind of smirk to yourself and you say, wait till you get a load of me, right? That I absolutely can. And we absolutely can. I think that often when people doubt, sometimes that is projection, right? They're not sure they can. And it gets kind of transferred onto you. And I will not allow that to stick. I don't allow doubt and underestimation to stick. I am Teflon to those things. And in that moment, rather than defending and and proving that I can, I try to look at it through an empathetic lens and say, see that person where they are. That's part of the strategic element too. Seeing with a third eye, hearing with a third ear and saying, you know, how can I reassure this person that we can do this together? With three of us on here with the strength of self-assurance, that is your number nine, Ophelia, and Brandon and I both share that uh, very high as well in our top 10. What was just articulated there is this notion effectively of we can't let somebody else's opinion of us become our opinion of ourself and allowing that to stick, that Teflon analogy that you gave. There's a level of resiliency that comes with that. And when we pair that with the strength, like strategic, the ability to see over the mountain, see the pathways, the numerous pathways across. The analogy I love to give with strategic is it's almost as if it's a, as if we get a helicopter ride to the top of the mountain and can see the numerous pathways across the valley very, very rapidly. And oftentimes we can see over the next mountain as well. And the reason I use the helicopter analogy, Brandon alluded to this earlier, is the speed at which it comes. And when we pair that with the strength of connectedness. Your number two, which you said is incredibly powerful for you as well. Strategic serves through that lens of that intuitiveness and oftentimes can lean, not necessarily always, but can lean more towards seeing that through a process and task level of how do we get there, what are the ways to do it, and understanding how people fit into that. Connectedness is like strategic in seeing that big picture and seeing it very much through the lens of each path that we're taking Who are the people that are being affected? So when you have those two together, the depth and how robust it is to be able to see the full big picture as it's talked about proverbially with speed and intuitiveness is really profound because one comes at it maybe a little more through the people lens of who are the people impacted by the choices that we make versus the other one coming at it through efficiency in in, in terms of the process. The, the task, does that kind of sum up how you've gotten to where you're at? I love it. It absolutely does. And I love, we're so in sync because you immediately connected it to connectedness. And I was thinking the same thing. I thought about a, a colleague that I recently had a conversation with and I was talking about a scenario and I said, it's important to have the ability to see around corners. And that's my strategic mind going. And the person said, but you can't see around corners. And I said, you can if you have somebody there looking out for you. And, and, you know, it kind of flows into that connectedness of where you are engaging people and you are connecting those dots and building those relationships. And so in that sense, you always have someone out there who's kind of keeping you abreast of what's going on, who knows your vision, understands where you're going, believes in it, shares it, and is bringing something from their lens. So they are actually helping you see around the corner, really. And I agree with you that it's it's having all of these different, these vantage points that come from your own life experiences, but also acknowledging the power that other people bring and leveraging that for this common goal. And so, yeah, strategic and connectedness are a perfect pairing. I really appreciate when you describe connectedness and you you brought it down to the area of passion around DEI and J. And you mentioned this as something that is strong within you. And now I'm going to bring restorative to play also because restorative is the strength that can see and solve growth restricted issues. It likes to look at them and find the pathways to a, an outcome that begins to create resolution, even if it brings it to a place of health, it might not make it all the way to thriving yet, but it sees how it can take something dysfunctional and now we're functioning. 
And I wonder if for the listeners today, because when we go down the path of DEI and J, there's a lot of understanding that is emerging of, okay, we see the problem. <laughs> like we can see the problem. But what we're looking for, I think many of us are trying to understand is, okay, so where are the solutions? <laughs> how, how do we start to solve? And it seems that your strengths have a unique connection around, okay, I can see it. I can connect it. I understand it. I have the strategy to see the path. Perhaps I'm even seeing solutions. And so would, would you care to share a bit about that and how that strength might be supporting some of that passion you have in that area? Absolutely. So when I... Restorative was an aha for me because it brought to mind the kind of premise for building my coaching consulting firm, Citro. And the logo has in the two O's of room, it has two light bulbs and they're in opposite directions of each other. And my thought there was almost creating this kind of yin and yang. And this person who comes into the Citro for situational guidance rooted in leadership challenges right? It's bringing a light with them. They are having a challenge, but they are bringing experience with them. They're bringing knowledge with them and passion with them. And that's why they're there because they want to resolve it. And so it's not just someone that I am helping for them, but I'm acknowledging this person's power and also acknowledging my own ability to help them in through a particular challenge. And so Citroen was developed with this understanding that we can find solutions together, exchanging energy together, merging our lights, if you will, uh, to find a solution. And so I think that the solution building comes in first acknowledging each person's power to effect a change and helping each person to see what their role is in making that change. So first, yes, problem identification. And then seeing how you can be a part of the solution and leveraging everything that you have, your talents, your knowledge, your experiences to come to that re revelation, not where I'm telling you who you are, but where you are realizing it and then actualizing it. Ophelia, I want to unpack this notion of power just a little bit and take us back a little bit into your story, because in the past, you had seen power mainly through the glasses of positional power strictly. And something awakened in you that, that took you to the place of seeing and understanding the power that you hold and that different people hold in their respective roles. Can you give some insights into what that, that story was like when the, the switch went on to you, when you realized it wasn't only about positional power and that you you did have the power to create influence and, 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 and make an impact. Sure. Thank you for welcoming that narrative. Um, I was a labor and delivery staff nurse and my assistant nurse manager one night is doing my performance review and said, Ophelia, it's time for you to train to become a charge nurse. And I said, absolutely not. I do not want the responsibility. I am a charge nurse's best friend. I am the person that has this check done, that supply there. You know, I will do all of the challenging deliveries with the premature babies, whatever it is. I anticipate the need, but I do not want that role. It is a hard job. And she said, yes. I said, no, we went back and forth. She did have the positional power, so I conceded. And, and um, I began becoming a charge nurse, and that is a, a role that is not a formal leadership role. It is you are in charge for that shift. But what I learned in that is that all the things that I had challenges with, working across the units was challenging, or working with mother baby across the units was challenging, or with the physicians, or whatever it may be, I could change. I could influence those things. And that I didn't necessarily need to be a manager to do it. Even though I only was in charge for the shift, I had a voice and that voice was regarded. That's why I was invited to train for the role. But also that I could identify these issues and that there would be support, that there was a team who wanted the same thing. Sometimes we don't always know how to get there. It taught me to trust that people want the same thing as you do. And sometimes they just need a little direction in how to get there. I don't need to be a manager. I don't have to have a title. I can do this within this realm. And that really solidified it for me, but it also made me want to go on because then I thought, I can do this as a charge nurse. Imagine what I can do as a manager. 
Uh, so it set me on the path for leadership. And I'm eternally grateful to that assistant nurse manager for setting me on this path. We love to hear the stories of how a catalyst lights the lights the fuse and then leadership emerges in someone's mind as and and maybe this will resonate with connectedness a calling as much as it's my career it starts to emerge as a calling i'm called to lead and when it seems that we can align who we are our personality our strengths our beliefs our values to a career this can really blossom. And I'm curious with your journey of leadership, because we hear in you what resonates with us, people first, culture builder, you're thinking about empowering people to be their very best. Can you describe a bit of that journey for you and how that's grown over the years? And as you've emerged into roles now where you're at a chief nursing officer level and you have reports who have reports who have reports. (laughs) Yes, thank you for asking. Again, it started with that charge nurse role. It started with someone seeing something in me that I did not yet see in myself. I talked to my team members about having a tackle box. Often you'll hear toolkit. I use tackle box because it reminds me of my grandfather of fishing. But it's 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 this idea, and when you look at a fishing tackle box, often what's in there looks really simple. There's nothing terribly sophisticated in there. It looks super simple, and yet it's these tools that help you go out and and gather things that are able to sustain you, right? And so I always think about how over time people and things that they taught me became a part of my tackle box. And it wasn't always having a formal or direct mentor or formal or direct sponsor. It was people who were just willing to impart a nugget of knowledge along the way. It might have been in one meeting or in one discussion it's observing as well. I love observing people. I love to learn from people. And so all of those things, I kept taking these little, you know, a little hook here and a little fly there and just putting it in my tackle box, right? And so it's one of the things that I encourage leaders to do is to learn from everyone and learn from everything. It's not about titles or roles. You can learn from anyone at any level in any part of the organization or department. Take that in, spend time talking to people, spend time observing people, sharpen, you know, that vision of your third eye and learn about the thing behind the thing, behind the thing, right? So it's also sharpening our sense of discernment and being more intuitive listeners. All of these things allow you to really build up that tackle box. And so I think that that's been something key for me in my journey, um, where sometimes, to your point, I have been underestimated as a woman ascending in the ranks, even though I'm in a largely woman-dominated profession, there's a lot of other variables that can sometimes have people underestimate you. And it is been for me saying, again, I got this. You haven't seen the best of me yet, but it's also making a way for other people. That has been an incredible part of my journey is seeking opportunities always to make room for someone else. And that's something that I always pass on to my teams. It's okay. Now that you've achieved it, congratulations. Now, who are you helping? Who are you bringing up? Who are you making room for? Who are you making this journey easier for? We don't have to haze each other in this leadership journey. What have been the things that have been most hurtful to you or harmful to you in your journey? And how are you removing those barriers for somebody else? And so when you do that, the level of personal fulfillment, the growth, because you're seeking those opportunities. So when you seek, you're stretching yourself. If I have to seek, it's not right in front of me. So seeking is uncomfortable in and of itself. And so I'm creating my own stretch goals for myself by looking for and creating opportunities. So that is what guides me. That is my guiding light. That is what I, quite frankly, expect of leaders on my team. I want to quickly comment on the tail end of what you just said. Your number eight strength is the strength of a learner. And I think you just gave one of the most complete answers of how learner leaders function that you 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 endeavor to learn from each source you don't count the newest one coming in lesser than the one who's been there the longest you know that each person inherently has value 
They have things to bring. And when we, when we elevate their value and we give them platform, they will shine. There's something there for each of us to grow in. And I'm exposing a little of my strength bias right now because I know Darren's a high learner. I am a little jealous of both of you. It's not one of my top strengths, but it's one of the strengths that I almost tell people, there's no downside to this one. <laughs> like This one is all up. It's always thinking and growing. And it's interesting for me to watch high learner leaders endeavor to infuse this into others, to help them get it. Because you said something critical. And I think across every industry, people have experienced that it's like the, I love the term hazing. It's like this rite of passage. It's like this, you have to go, you have to go through the hard things we went through. It's someone that can go, why? <laughs> why do we have to do that to them? Why can't we make the path smoother? Why can't we remove the rocks? Why can't we help them? It, it, leadership's hard enough. <laughs> it's hard enough without having your mentors intentionally set minds in front of you. So uh, just wanted to call that out because I so deeply appreciate the level with which you're you're articulating how that mindset creates gravitas. People are drawn to those leaders because you actually feel, whoa, you're not just caring, but you're listening and you're valuing and you're elevating me. And those, it's the seedbed for emerging leaders. It's the seedbed for creating organizations where leadership is implied now in what we do, whether it's titled or not. That's who we are and what we do. So thank you for sharing that. That was such a great example of learner, everyone. And I'll put my bias away now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for learner leaders, it's so much of that, Ophelia, really resonated with me as well. As, as Brandon mentioned, it's, it's one of my top 10 strengths as well. In what you articulated, what you shared, it, you talked about the power of those stretch goals, making mistakes along the way and going through. And one of the big things that learner leaders bring to the table is the notion of fail first attempt in learning. Brandon's been hearing me say that for 10 years of, of being together and, and, and working on this journey. I heard elements of that in what you're bringing to the table for your leaders to, to, to kind of step into themselves. And one piece that you acknowledged before that, that I wanted to ask a question on. When we were chatting before the show, you talked a, a little bit about getting people that you lead to acknowledge their own power. And you also talked about the tackle box and then collecting these experiences and, and learning and developing that tackle box. It sounds like getting them to acknowledge their power is actually the tackle box in and of itself. I love that association. One, knowing that you have a top tackle box is self-empowering and collecting those knowing being discerning to know this is good for my tackle box. There's power in that. Only you can do that, right? Only you can supply your tackle box. People can throw tidbits at you and it's inspirational quotes and keynote speeches, but only you know what you need. I, I, another analogy I love to use because I'm a nurse is metabolizing. When you eat, you take something in. Your body knows what it eats. It takes the nutrients and it excretes the rest. But only your body and its unique biochemistry knows what it needs. And so there's power in building that box in and of itself. And that tackle box is your power. And what we talked about is this idea of empowering people. I don't believe in it. I really don't believe in it. I believe, much as I spoke about with Citroom, is that you bring your own power into a space. You have it. I can help you through sharing tools, sharing experiences and knowledge. I can certainly help you shine brighter. But the power is already there. And so it is, as Brandon said, it is making space, holding space, giving platform. And then in recognizing your power, really amplifying that and making room for other people to see it. It's all of those things, but this idea of empowering is something that I would love leaders to put away because it's not about us. And I want to just make sure I clarify that point for our listeners. Ophelia mentioned before she talked about she doesn't believe in leaders empowering. She talked about self-empowerment. I don't want that to be lost for you as leaders. What is very clear there is the power to empower, it lives right within us. 
So it's not that there's there's something wrong with the word empowerment, but we need to you know interject self empowerment. A leader is just helping there, trying to get those sparks going and and getting getting that candle lit so that people can can do that and, and awaken that awareness of of that power. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You know, as we're talking, I'm thinking about the reality that as leaders come into the scene, and I love the term making space, holding space for them, and and respecting the the variance, the difference, the uniqueness that each one brings, and why that is such an advantage to us when we respect the difference. We we identify that our personalities are so intricately unique. In in the strengths finder world, they there's a stat that's often used about the fact that someone's top five has a one in 33 million possibility of someone sharing it in that order. So it's such a, and in their 30 million respondents, they've never had it. It's not come yet. And just how, what that can tell you, the science can tell us about how unique individuals are. And when you, I'm going to talk a little bit about your responsibility strength. So your responsibility holds you often with leaders hold you to this self accountability because it's this, no one can hold you to an accountability higher than you can hold yourself. I wanted to pull that up a bit because that strength sometimes gets a bad rap. Sometimes people look at that and like, ah, oh, dang it. I got responsibility. Yes. Everybody comes to me when they have a problem. I'm the go-to in the family because I'm good for it. And so, so sometimes it gets that like, ah, do I have to have this one? But then when it's embraced as, yeah, but this is my calling card. This is why people trust me. This is why I'm good for it when I say I'm going to follow through. And so I wonder if you can explore some of that because you have brought forward today some really powerful concepts that I, I mean, listeners, if you're picking up what she's putting down today, there are some really powerful pieces that we as leaders can grow from. So curious your thoughts on that responsibility connection. I welcome it. As you said, I welcome it. One, it's a facet of the power that I talked about. Our own self-empowerment is there and clarified and so true. It's a facet of that. Self-accountability, it's that intrinsic motivation. It's something from within that says, I, I want to do this. I need to do this. I understand why it's important and where it fits into the world and how it influences. And that's exciting for me, being able to connect those dots within and say, like, I understand how putting this thing out into the world, whether it's a project, whether it's a thought, whether it's advice, whatever it is, I understand this is probably the strategic piece too, <laughs> and maybe some connectedness, but I understand how it's going to bear fruit. I can see it. I can visualize it. And that vision is what I'm responsible to. Right. So it's almost the thing now, but before I talked about the thing behind the thing, now it's the thing beyond the thing. Right. And so it becomes in doing this task that some people go, oh, I am seeing the bigger picture and what this will now flow into and what it can become. And so that's where I find responsibility really exciting. It can be taxing. Sure. But to your point, it's about perspective. Do you think today that as you think about your strengths and you think about, you know, this idea of you're growing in self-awareness, you're growing in knowledge. And so we, you got this, this assessment, I'm sure you've probably taken your fair share of these across lots of different landscapes over the years. Anything for us today that you'd like to ask about strength specific engagement work we do that we might be able to support you with today? But what I first want to start with is thanking you for this incredible work and the depth and breadth of knowledge you have behind finding and everything that I've learned from it. So thank you for your expertise. I would love to understand more about restorative because, again, that was an aha for me. And so wanting to understand more about that strength and how you see it show up and maybe for someone that it's higher in their top five, what does that look like? Yeah. So I, I want to give a fair disclaimer about this particular strength as I address it. Out of my 34 strengths, this is number 34. So I'm about to speak to you <laughs> from a person who does not possess this. Now, I want to tell a quick story. I have seven children, and we have used StrengthsFinder as a 
bedrock of our parenting. We have used this approach and probably where all of my greatest lessons are learned, right? And with our oldest daughter, she was nearing about 16 years old. And my wife and I just found ourselves constantly at odds with her, constantly. Just we'd say up, she's down. We'd say left, she says right. And just wondering, what is it about this child <laughs> that we just can't seem to connect? And so one day we said, okay, Bailey, sweetheart, would you be willing to take this assessment with us? Let's learn about who you are. Let's learn your strengths. And she was right at that age. It's about 15 years old that Gallup recommends. So she was right there. Well, she took the assessment. And I should now also mention that restorative is my wife's 34 also. <laughs> Well, it was Bailey's number one. And so here we are as parents going, oh my, my goodness. <laughs> we are trying to change our daughter into us, which is a mistake many leaders make and many parents make. We try to merge them into who we are and come to realize, oh my, this is how Bailey's wired. So I'll expound on with that bedrock because I have been a student of this strength for 15 years now. <laughs> my daughter turns... 30 this year. So 15 years, I have been studying deeply this strength because I want, a, I want a positive relationship with my daughter and I work around many restoratives. It's actually the counterpart to this strength is often maximizer. So if restoratives high, maximizer comes lower, vice versa. So maximizer restoratives have two very different opinions, but they can often meet around the side of the circle that gets to improvement, process improvement, advancement, upgrading, benefiting where restorative is really strong and acute is in that ability to troubleshoot, to assess, to, in your world, diagnose, find prescription, look for it. And so interestingly enough, you might resonate with this. Many people in the medical field have restorative as a high strength because you are looking for what's the trail of symptoms leading to? What do all the signs point to? And so you have this really cool advantage because you connect it with connectedness. Because sometimes you need the third eye to see the thing that you can't see. And other times you need strategic, which is, it was just often a partner with restorative, by the way, those two come together often. So the interesting piece in some of the models is you get them to, you know, triage, right? I get them to now they're stable and a restorative can get you there and then move on. They can go to the next case. So they, they may not also then go all the way to the next level. That's sometimes where the handoff goes to a maximizer who says, hey, hey restorative, thanks for getting this thing to healthy. Cause that whole triage troubleshooting, that wears me out. <laughs> I want to go good to great, great to awesome. You know, I'm always looking for the, the upgrade side. And so this particular strength, when it shows in top five, also comes with bravery, a courage to, and I'm going to use a little explicit language, to wait right into the shit, <laughs> like to get right into the, 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 the mess and go, back up everybody, I got this, I got this, like I, I'll handle it. And so for many restoratives, stepping into the chaos, stepping into the challenge, not that they have to look for it because it finds us, but their skill set at just calm, cow, and they can just get to that place of, I can see the challenge and now I can help move us to health. And so does that help? Add some color to that. That was perfect. Thank you. And thank you for the motivation to do this with my children. That's an excellent application. It's so smart now that I have two teenagers, but also really great explanation. I, I have more for you. You asked a question and Brandon has a daughter with restorative is number one. I'm married to a top five restorative and I am a bottom five restorative as well. So my wife a story that I want to share with you. It's really interesting. In the past, we would both make, make dinner at times, right? So maybe one night she had made dinner. We're sitting down, we're eating, and she's starting to say, ah, oh, I should have added a little bit more salt or a little bit more pepper. And she's already fixing it for the next time. And in my mind, I'm hearing that and receiving that as why can't we just sit down and enjoy a meal? I'm so grateful that you sat down and that you took the time to make this meal. How, why are you being so critical? In, in her mind, Ophelia, when we actually got through it, she wasn't actually seeing it, that she was being critical. She was naturally solving it for the next time. I was hearing that as problem fixation and completely missing what she was doing, and it was causing us to, to butt heads. Now it's something that we could sit through and laugh at. 
where I'm taking this from the leadership chair is sometimes when we're, we are in a situation, if you are working with somebody who is asking the question of a restorative, why are you always focusing on the negatives? Which we know is in fact not true, just like it wasn't true with my wife. She wasn't focusing on the negatives. She was actually focusing on how to make it more positive next time. What can happen from a communication standpoint is we lead with restorative in talking about the problem and then getting to here's ways to solve it because naturally that can be how the mental pathways work. Let's talk about the problem, dig into it, then move to the solutions. If we invert that order and talk about the solution that we're seeking and back into the problem, a lot of times we actually create the buy-in that's needed. Even if so, Brandon and I both being maximizers, if we hear, hey, here's what I think needs solving. Here's what this problem repaired actually might look like. That will bring people in, and then we back into a series of, well, what are the problems? So we're reverse engineering that, and when that communication flips, sometimes when we are in situations where things are getting a little contentious, mm -hmm. it actually completely shifts that, and it allows things to move further faster with connection. It's worked in my marriage beautifully, and, um, and I've seen it work within our team, because as Brandon mentioned, with two maximizers at 34 strong, it's we are surrounded by a lot of restorative and it's critical for balancing us out. All right. So I've gotten parenting guidance. I've gotten some marriage guidance and a mini coaching session between the both of you. So the value here is incredible. Thank you. So good. <laughs> we, we are happy that has been the case. So Ophelia, if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, where should they go? Please go to Ophelia at sitchroom.com. That's Ophelia at sitchroom, S as in strength, I, T, as a top five, C-H, room.com. Excellent, Ophelia. Thank you so much for that. We will have the link uh, to that information in our show notes as well. Thanks again. You've been a truly remarkable guest. We really appreciate you sharing your insights. For our listeners out there, are you ready to discover your strengths to accelerate into life like Ophelia has? We believe in this path so much, we are offering our listeners the opportunity to discover their top five Clifton strengths. All you have to do is email us at Brandon, that's B R A N D O N, at 34 strong, and that is the number 34, and then strong spelt out.com. Once again, that's Brandon at 34 strong.com. Include in the subject line top five to request your Strengths Finder code. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Strengths Whisperer. What did you take away from the conversation with Ophelia? We'd love to know. Just email us at Brandon at 34 strong.com. Again, if you are ready to discover your top five strengths, include top five in the subject line. Listeners, we want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Strengths Whisperer. We'll see you soon.